Bitcoin and I realized what it was. It was a network of money and it was growing, you know, steadily and exponentially um, and that everyone needs money uh, and that it is, you know, truly the best form of sound money. I mean, as, as Saylor and Preston have said recently, there's no deflection in it. You know, there's just 21 million of them and that's it. Um, you know, it's it's just to me, it's it's such an obvious, clear bet. And, you know, you said um, price predictions. I mean, I, you know, I have no idea where it's going tomorrow or I don't, I don't know where it's going to be at the end of the year, although I, I, I mean, I'm guessing maybe 100K or something. But, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is going to be 200K and then someday it's going to be a million, someday it's going to be 2 million, someday it's going to be 8 million per coin. I'm talking that. Hey guys, welcome back to Everyday Finance. In this video, Larry Leopard discusses Bitcoin and crypto. Sharing knowledge underwent a revolutionary transformation with the advent of the printing press. Bitcoin has experienced the similar impact on finances. We now have a way to store value that is not controlled by a select few individuals. Bitcoin is set to revolutionize our perspective on money and investing, similar to how the internet expanded our horizons. People will discover how easy it is to make smart investments and avoid wasting their money on unprofitable ventures. The current system gives a small group of people the power to control how money is distributed. However, we have the opportunity to take control of our own finances and create a better future by using Bitcoin. It's interesting to reflect on our past financial practices and question why we ever thought they made sense. Lawrence Leppard, a well-known investment manager and Bitcoin enthusiast, was ahead of his time when he made internet investments in 1993 and 1994. He then ventured into investing in precious metals like gold and silver, and now he believes he has stumbled upon a unique opportunity Bitcoin Larry, fondly referred to as Larry, made an investment in Bitcoin when its value was a mere $300 per coin. In this interview, he shares his insights on the current state of Bitcoin, drawing parallels to the early days of the internet. He expresses optimism about its potential to reach significant value per coin, potentially in the millions of dollars. And lots of things Larry Leppard discusses, so please watch the video to end, and like, share this video, and subscribe our channel Everyday Finance. Thanks. I make the mistake, you know, a third time. So when I saw Bitcoin and I realized what it was, it was a network of money, and it was growing, you know, steadily and exponentially, um, and that everyone needs money. Uh, and that it is, you know, truly the best form of sound money. I mean, as, as Saylor and Preston have said recently, there's no deflection in it. You know, there's just 21 million of them and that's it. Um, you know, it's it's just to me, it's it's such an obvious, clear bet. And, you know, you said um, price predictions. I mean, I, you know, I have no idea where it's going tomorrow or I don't, I don't know where it's going to be at the end of the year, although I, I, I mean, I'm guessing maybe 100K or something. But, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is going to be 200K and then someday it's going to be a million, someday it's going to be 2 million, someday it's going to be 8 million per coin. I'm talking that because that's just the, that's just the natural progression of, you know, the growth of a, of a network. And so, um, you know, that's why I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm pounding the table just to, you know, and, and people getting into it, they think, well, I'm paying too much. I mean, I have a friend who's very, very wealthy and, you know, he knows my average cost is quite low. And, you know, you just can't bear to pay 60 or 70 grand. I said, look, you, you, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, I paid, you know, I don't know, whatever I paid. I mean, in the thousands for probably as an average. Um, but, you know, Max Kaiser was paying two dollars. And, and I, you know, I don't regret Max. You know, I, I mean, I just recognize that, you know, I mean, someday what I, you know, my average cost is going to seem incredibly cheap to somebody who's paying two million dollars a coin. So it, it's just, it, you know, it, it's it's Sailor's point. I mean, it's going up forever, Laura. I mean, <laughs> and so, so, I mean, you can either decide, you know, I mean, you can, you're going to buy it eventually. People don't realize that everybody's going to buy this eventually. I don't think anyone realizes, or I don't think a lot of people realize that. So you might as well buy it now versus waiting and having to pay a lot more for it in the future. That's a really smart question. Um, you know, and, and, and the answer is nuanced. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the internet really really started to take off from an investment point of view in 95 when Netscape went public, and Netscape was the initial browser, right? And the run-up um, from 95 to 98 was quite substantial. 
Um, you know, if you go back and you look at some of the leading companies at the time, Sun Microsystems is a microcomputer company, or Cisco Systems, which is the router company, probably the most important piece of the in infrastructure of the, of the internet. They all went up quite substantially, multiples of, of their value from 94 to, you know, say 98, okay? And, and it actually was getting pretty nutty. I mean, I was originally buying companies at you know, one or two times revenues in the early mid 90s 93 4 5 and you know by 98 they were selling at five six seven eight times uh multiples and then in the summer of 98 something happened that's very re relevant um you know there was a there was a russia had a crisis and uh and actually there was a crisis in the in the far east as well but the the, the bottom line is there was there was a there was kind of a currency event that then led to long-term capital management blowing up. Long-term capital management was a highly leveraged hedge fund run by a bunch of PhD geniuses in the United States who were absolutely convinced they had a, a money-making machine um, through le by you know playing the bond market using leverage, and of course they blew up um, as so many of the similar guys like that do, and this was in um, in the fall of summer August September of '98. And they were big enough and they had enough of the Wall Street players involved that they would have taken the entire, you know, market down and, and Wall Street down. And um, the Fed came in and they leaned on all the investment banks to basically bail them out. And um, and they injected, they, they dropped interest rates, they injected a ton of liquidity. The cryptocurrency market has experienced a positive movement today, with the total market capitalization increasing by around 2% in the past. In just 24 hours, the market cap has soared to an impressive $2.32 trillion on July 1st. This surge can be attributed to the gains made by Bitcoin and Ethereum, which have risen by approximately 2.5% and 2.2% respectively. The crypto market is experiencing a significant boost today, thanks to various factors such as a divergence in the macro environment, which has reduced sell-side pressure and a strengthening market structure. Upon examining the recent performance of the crypto market, it becomes evident that it has been showing signs of improvement since the Federal Open Market Committee meeting on June 12th. The meeting, which largely met investors' expectations, resulted in the Fed Fund's target range remaining unchanged at 5.25% to 5.5%. This led to a drop in certain aspects. The U.S. inflation, as indicated by the Consumer Price Index, was lower than anticipated last week. On the other hand, the real gross domestic product exceeded expectations slightly, reaching 1.4%. This positive outcome contributed to the overall improvement in market sentiment. Furthermore, the release of the Personal Consumption Expenditures Report on June 28th, coupled with a slowdown in key areas such as the US labour market in recent weeks, has heightened the likelihood of two interest rate cuts by the central bank this year. According to the latest data from CME Group's FedWatch tool, there is a 58.2% chance of a rate cut at the FOMC meeting on September 18th and a 43.3% chance at the December 18th meeting. When assessing the crypto bull market across various time frames, trading activity often exhibits heightened volatility, with frequent corrections and consolidations. It's important to note that markets don't always move in an upward direction which can create gaps in supply and demand dynamics, leading to local and global price correction events. One method for assessing supply and demand involves analyzing the movement of stable coins into and out of exchanges. According to the data from CryptoQuent, there is information available on the average size of the total amount of the top 10 US transactions that are flowing out from exchanges. Examining the trend from 2023 to the present, the chart shows a decline in outflows following a significant surge. This indicates that the intense selling pressure on exchanges is gradually subsiding. The decrease in outflows suggests that investors are now more inclined to retain their assets instead of withdrawing cash from the market. Let's get back to Larry Leppard interview. And 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 they more or less papered it over. And and the one investment bank that didn't play, by the way, is Bear Stearns. And of course, that's why Bear Stearns was assassinated first in the Great Financial Crisis because they hadn't played the game um, when they were, you know, when the gun was put to their head by by the Wall Street cartel. So um, you know that that occurred and that. Um, that bailout 
so to speak, and that cut in interest rates and that boost in liquidity got the next leg going. And I, honestly, I thought at, at that point in time, I thought, you know, this internet thing has gotten a little bit frothy and it's about to cool off. Um, but I was quite wrong. Uh, it, it took off on another leg and, and then it really got nuts. From 98 to 2000, things went from 10 times revenues to 100 times revenues. And, you know, pets.com came public. And I mean, you just had all kinds of insane shit going on to the point where, you know, just anything. I mean, you saw companies, basic companies putting .com in their name, um, you know, it was, it was a, it was a nutty time. And my partner and I, we would sit around and say, you know, are we the only two guys left in the world that think that a company is worth its discounted future cash flows? <laughs> because I'm, you know, what was going on is you had all these wall street guys, you know, you had Harry Blodgett and you had Mary Meeker, you had all these other shills, you know, talking about, I mean, Blodgett was the guy who basically was, you know, saying he was touting the shit out of these stocks. He was working at Morgan Stanley at the time, touting the shit out of these stocks. And they found internal emails where he said, this thing's a complete piece of shit. You know, and so, so I mean, which is, you know, that's typical of Wall Street ethics, right? Um, you know, and he, I, I think he was censured for, maybe banned for securities industry for a while. I can't remember. He should have been. But anyway, long story short, I mean, you know, they were all toting the shit out of the, you know, pumping the shit out of this thing, and and it, and it went parabolic, really. Um, and it was just, it was nuts. I mean, they were all overvalued. I mean, even Scott McNeely, who ran Sun Microsystems, came out and said, "I wouldn't buy my stock. It's way overvalued." He was being very honest. Um, and, and we could all see it, but, but we didn't know when it would burst. Um, and of course, March of 2000 was when it did burst. Um, you know, and that interestingly occurred, you know, just after the last liquidity injection, which was an Alan Greenspan printed a ton of money because he was worried about year 2k. But anyway, the, the story, you know, the story there was you could see all of the excesses and the valuation extremes had just gotten completely nutty. Um, and people were paying silly prices for anything that had internet in the name or dot com in the name. And, uh, and it, it just couldn't last. And of course the last buyer showed up and then it cratered. Um, so compare that to Bitcoin today and, and compare that to the markets today. Um, it's, you know, it, as I said, the answer is somewhat nuanced because, um, the, you know, I don't think it, it, it it's, I don't think it, it applies quite as directly to Bitcoin because you don't have a ton of Bitcoin public companies and you don't have, you know, the crazy price appreciation. Well, you do have some pretty serious price appreciation, but you don't have, you know, the nutty price appreciation recently that you had at the tail end of the experience with the dot com companies where it does apply to today is in a, in a stock like NVIDIA. OK, I mean, I, I see. You know, we're, we're, we're in a, in a bubble driven by low cost money and, you know, everyone post 2008, and I just tweeted about this, it's in the marketplace has basically, um, in the stock market has basically learned to buy the dip. And, um, you know, I'm here to tell you that bear markets do exist. And I, I define a bear market as something more than a 20% correction. I mean, recall that coming out of the 2000 bubble burst, the S&P went down 50%, the NASDAQ went down 80%. Coming out of the 2008 bubble burst, you know, the housing where housing prices can never go down in the country, which was a lie, by the way, they did go down in the 30s. But um, following the 2008 bubble burst, the S&P went down 50 percent. Um, some of the housing companies went to zero, you know, what I mean, um, you know, and Lehman and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, a lot of the people heavily involved in housing went down 80 percent. So um, I think we've got another one of those coming, but at the sovereign credit level which actually ought to be a positive event for gold and Bitcoin because they represent the anti the antithesis of sovereign credit. They represent, um, you know, distributed money that can't be printed by the government. And, um, you know, when I, when I talk to investors, the thing I always point out is that we know that the government is programmed to grow the money supply. They literally have to mathematically because otherwise Stein's law, appear, you know, applies. And, you know, it can't go on forever. It's going to end. <laughs> And so as a result of that, um, if one is trying to protect one's savings, one has to be in assets that the government can't print. And the government can't print gold, the government can't print silver, the government can't print Bitcoin. Um, you know, the government can't print housing, but they can tax it and it's hard to move around and it's illiquid. And the government can't print stocks, but guess what? Stocks, stock com you know, the, the companies can print stocks. They can issue more shares. And so... Um, you know, everyone thinks that stocks are a great place to hang out to protect you from inflation. And, and look, in a hyperinflation, they do protect you. They represent a claim on the earnings power of a business. But 
<laughs> during a, a severe economic downturn, stocks are going to get crushed. And so I, I would not be a participant in the stock market today, really in, in anything except perhaps the commodity stocks, which I am a participant in. Uh, I still have the fund with the gold and silver miners in it. And, and I'm committed to getting my investors out at a very large profit. Um, and then at some point in time, you know, I will, I will transition that fund or close that fund down and probably spend most all my time on things related to Bitcoin, because I think Bitcoin is a better asymmetric bet than gold. I think gold will protect your purchasing power. I think Bitcoin will grow your purchasing power. So, um, you know, and, and, and look, gold is analog sound money. Bitcoin is digital sound money. That's the way I view it. It seems that investor sentiment is becoming more positive as sellers start to tire out meanwhile. The spot price of Bitcoin has dipped below the realized price of short-term holders, which stood at $162,600 right now. Statistics show a slightly negative average profitability, which is a metric that has traditionally been used to identify periods of seller exhaustion from a technical perspective. The gains in the crypto market today are part of a rebound that started at a support confluence. This confluence includes the major support at $2.18 trillion and the middle boundary of an ascending parallel channel. Currently, the total market cap is at $2.27 trillion, having broken above the upper boundary of the channel during the July 1st recovery. This breakout signals a reversal from the previous downtrend. According to technical analysis, the crypto market could rise towards the $2.52 trillion area, which is embraced by the upper tip of the declining channel. However, before reaching this level, the total market cap needs to overcome supplier congestion between $2.30 trillion and $2.35 trillion, where all the major moving averages are located. If you learned something from this video, then please like this video and subscribe our channel Everyday Finance and we will meet in next video. Thanks.